Lost and Found, you graduated. Tell us about the impact of Lost and Found in your life. I was in Lost and Found for roughly four months. I was there simply because I came out as transgender in January to my family and um, I was kicked out and my college tuition was taken from me. And Lost and Found was, was really there when I needed them. Not only did they provide shelter and um, just money for food and transportation, it was, it was a family. It was definitely a community that I didn't have and I'm just so grateful for. Um, being there, I was able to save up the money to now pay for tuition for next semester. And I am a second semester senior, so I will be able to graduate in December, nice. which is something I'm really excited about and just really grateful for. You're not fully transitioning to male, so to speak. Right. So talk about your gender identity. I identify as non-binary or transmasculine. I still say FTM, but instead of it meaning female to male, to me it means feminine to masculine. I use um, he, him, or they, them pronouns. And honestly, for me, I just don't see gender as being two set things. I see it as a spectrum. There's fluidity to it. And definitely, I just can't be confined to a box. I'm definitely more masculine than anything, which is why I'm on testosterone and um, I do bind and everything. But I just don't see myself fitting either side. So tell me about your beginnings in the church. You said the beginnings of it was actually a great experience. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and I really do feel that the church is still a place for me. Um, growing up, like I said, was awesome. Singing in the choir and I look forward to praise dance team and being able to fellowship with the community. But things changed as I got older and decided to live my life and make my choices, my own choices, so. Tell me about that moment where you, you felt things changing for yourself and other people were seeing that change. It kind of began to be scary, honestly. It was like, am I gonna lose people in my life that I love dearly because of the changes that I'm going to make that I feel that is beneficial for myself? And I just didn't want to actually make that transition at that time mm -hmm. to go ahead and just do it full through. Mm -hmm. So I just somewhat preserved that time mm -hmm. to try to make more people understanding. Mm -hmm. But you really can't make anyone understanding. And because you work with the kids, maybe you can give us some insight. How does a parent throw their kid out on the street because of religious beliefs like how I mean it's one thing to say okay that's a quote-unquote sin whatever right. that means but to say get out of my house and they're not being violent and they're doing good in school right. how, how do you figure that on your head most parents find a way to justify it and they usually justify it either as the child being defiant against them and their household rules or they find that they'll blame it on the child engaging with a certain kind of crowd or hanging with the wrong kind of people because that gay crowd is just a certain element that they don't want their child around. So they'll always find a way to justify the reason they put them out. Then they'll give you the, I didn't put you out, you put yourself out because you chose to be gay. Being raised Christian, being raised Kojic, I'm Kojic, so baby, I, I am, I'm Pentecostal, I'm, I am the Bible, you know, so being raised that way, you naturally have a spiritual conviction over you at all times, so the spiritual warfare that you go through internally is enough to run you ragged. For me, I'm, to this day, I'm always stuck between a rock and a hard place because I do believe in God and I go to church every Sunday and my grandmother's a church missionary and, you know, but there's this thirst. I have this thirst that only gets quenched in a way that it shouldn't be being quenched, okay? But, um, you know, but, you know, I, I have to be strong in myself because I know that when I have to answer, I have to answer for me. I can't answer for my grandmother, my aunt, my uncle, my brother. I have to answer for me. So if I'm going to do it, I have to be comfortable with whatever I'm doing because if I go to hell, it's my fault. If I make it into heaven, it's my fault. Truth be told, I'll never find a comfort zone in the gay lifestyle.
I'm not saying this, but a lot of people are going to say, because I've been doing interviews for a long time, (laughs) so I I can feel people are going to say, they're going to look at you, they're going to think he has a great energy, he's funny, but they're going to say that he is a self-hating gay man, that he does not love himself, and he's been brainwashed and taught a certain thing. That's what what they're going to say, that he's been brainwashed and taught a certain thing. He's self-hating. It's not his fault. He has been taught this. He's brainwashed. What's what's your response to that? For me, I know it's not that. I absolutely know it's not that. It will never be that. It's not that. It won't be. It isn't. It is what it is. But I also feel like on the other end of the spectrum, you don't take time enough to evaluate. This is someone who knows their facts for them and makes their determination based on the facts. Because the one thing we cannot measure is emotion. So there's no room for emotions or feelings when it comes to the facts. So my facts are this, and based upon this, my end results are this. So, you know, for the person who hears this and draws that conclusion, I can't be mad that based upon the facts that you pull from, that's the answer you get. Do you love yourself? Definitely. If I don't, who will? I have to. Because if I don't love myself, how can I teach my youth? to love themselves. What do you think of, uh, of gay churches? There's gay churches here in Atlanta. Mm. Mm. So you're playing with me, right? <laughs> you know, I do not believe in them. And I understand that the word can come from anywhere, but I was raised where you look to your pastor to be your spiritual guidance, your spiritual leader, You know, you look for them for the strength when you are weak. And for me, me personally, I can't look to you knowing you do the same sin I do and you can't help me overcome it if I wanted to because you're comfortable in it. Look at your neighbor and say, anything God gives you, it's not yours, it's his. And God gave it to you to be. And that same person that says that they would never come to a church like this, trust me, in time, will come, have an experience here, and find themselves walking down those aisles because God will meet them here and will change their heart and their mind. I just have uh, the utmost gratitude that we have a place to come, first of all, and we're not shunned, and we are affirmed, and we are supported, you know, because I know of people in my circle of friends who don't have that support, not from their families, not from the current church they're going to, you know, with 3,000, 7,000, 8,000 members, and where their pastor stands on the pulpit and preaches damnation and preaches them straight to hell. Now, I think that's a, a lot that goes on today in the African-American church that they don't forgive quickly. You know, they say that, you know, some people say they love all people, but uh, the actions don't really show that they really love all people. And I have friends who stay in churches that do not affirm them. That like, I, I, was, I, I watched your sermon today, you may have mentioned LGBT once or twice. They're going to straight churches, they're mentioning LGBT for an hour, mm-hmm. right? and they stay in these churches that are saying terrible things. And I'm like, why are you staying? So explain that. Why would someone stay in an environment like that? Clay, I think it's it's complicated. I think it would be easy for those of us who have gone through a process uh, to say, why don't you come out the church? But the truth is, from a cultural perspective, you know, our, our ties are deep to our churches because they're deep to our families. That's right. You know, this is an issue that's bigger than the pastor, you know, it it may include how the pastor may feel and what's preached, but you know, the church experience is bigger than the sermon. You know, many people, their great grandparents or their grandparents or their parents were at the church. You know, their, their extended families, they have deep traditions and family roots in these spaces. And so it's not so easy to say, you know, you should leave this place that doesn't affirm you. And you know, that doesn't make it healthy. But I mean, we all have families that may have people that have all kinds of perspectives 
that don't force us to leave. That doesn't make us leave the church or leave our families because of different perspectives. Um, I think that's why a church like this is so critical and important. But let me say this. I do think that um, as LGBT folks, we have to take a critical look at our spiritual spaces. And, and he knows this very much about me. And I, I may be a little bit more of a hardliner than even he is. I do not participate in my oppression. It's, it's where I live. Um, and I do not, it takes me, let me say it different, it takes me great work to go into a space where I feel like people are not going to be supportive of us and of our families because I find our families and I find our marriage just as equal and valuable to theirs. Mm -hmm.